going to do is talk about limits of functions and specifically relate that back to the discussion of continuity that we've been having in the last few videos right so uh, it's going to be largely definitions and connections between definitions so let me begin by first the basic definition of what it means uh, to say that limit x tends to a f of x is something okay so let's start with that definition Okay, so we will say that limit x tends to a f of x is equal to some real number l if the following condition is true. For all epsilon greater than 0, there exists delta greater than 0 such that If x is within a delta distance of a, but not equal to a, then f of x minus f of a must be less than epsilon in absolute value. Okay, so again, if since we have seen these kind of definitions before, it should be clear that what we are saying is that limit x tends to a f of x is equal to l if as x becomes close to a, uh, sorry, not f of a, I made a mistake here, this is l. There's no reference to the function value at a here. Okay. Uh, so, we say that x, limit x tends to a f of x is equal to l if as x becomes close to a, the function value becomes close to l. Right, and how do we capture closeness? You specify an error. This is the standard technique, right? You specify an error threshold epsilon. For any positive error threshold epsilon, it is possible to prescribe a certain delta such that so long as the argument of the function is within a distance of delta from A, but not equal to A, right? That is what this part of the uh, inequality ensures. Uh, so long as this is the case, then in fact, the function value will be within an epsilon distance of, uh, wait, let me just put this throughout. Okay, so uh, that's the definition for limit x tends to a f of x is equal to L. Now clearly there are also going to be analogous definitions for what happens if L is plus infinity or minus infinity. So let me write the version for plus infinity and the minus infinity step I will leave to you. So we say... Infinity if the following condition is satisfied. Now, what is this supposed to capture? This is supposed to capture the fact that as the argument of the function approaches a, the function value basically grows unboundedly, right? So, how would this be? Naturally, you would say that for any m, let's say m greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that 0 less than mod x minus a less than delta implies that f of x is larger than m. Okay, so this would be the definition for uh, the limit as x tends to a f of x equals infinity. Uh, there is of course going to be an analogous definition for minus infinity. Right, and I leave this for you to fill in. Okay, uh, so these are uh, elementary definitions, but uh, there are a few things that I'd like to remark here. Firstly, that the function value at a does not enter into this limit at all. So limit. It does not depend 
on the function value at a itself so note that whenever we are we are prescribing a certain delta within which uh, let's say the function value is close to l or large enough or small enough uh, we are explicitly saying that x minus a is strictly between 0 and delta which means that i am excluding the value at a itself okay so it's very important to note that uh, whether or not limit x tends to a f of x exists and whether uh, that limit is a real number or plus infinity or minus infinity does not depend on the function value at a itself okay so this is extremely important another thing to note is since we have already talked about continuity uh, I hope it is also not very hard for you to see that f is continuous at a if and only if limit x tends to a is equal to f of a. Okay, so uh, on one hand the limit itself does not depend on the function value at a and continuity of the function at a is equivalent to saying that the limit as x tends to a of f of x is in fact equal to the function value at a, right? So again, uh, I'm going to leave this as an exercise to you. Go back and use just the definition, the epsilon delta definition of continuity to argue that in fact, uh, what I have written here as remark two is in fact true, okay? Uh, now remember when we defined continuity, we had of course the epsilon delta definition, but we also had the sequential definition, right? Similarly, uh, in the process of defining this object limit x tends to a f of x, one can write the epsilon delta definition, which is what we have done above, but one can also write a sequential definition, okay? So let me actually write that sequential definition. So again, these are very straightforward, but uh, yeah. It's good to be aware of these things and the arguments are going to be fairly straightforward. So limit x tends to a f of x is equal to L which is either R So uh, L could be any extended real number uh, if and only if the following is true. For any sequence uh, satisfying the following conditions. So for one, Xn should not be equal to A for all N and xn should converge to a okay so for any such sequence which without ever taking the value of a itself converges to a we have f of xn tending to l So again, not difficult to show at all. We have already shown uh, a result like this when we talked about the epsilon delta definition of continuity and related that to the sequential definition. All we are saying is that there is an epsilon delta definition for a function limit, limit x tends to a f of x and an equivalent sequential definition. Okay, so again, I leave the uh, verification of this fact to you. Okay. So uh, let's move on. So, so far what we have done is define this object, right? Limit x tends to a f of x, right? Now, uh, and we have made a connection to continuity, right? So continuity at any point is equivalent to saying that the function limit at that point is equal to the function value at that point, right? Uh, next, we will also define uh, so-called left and right limits of a function. So the right limit of the function at a is typically denoted by a plus. We say this is equal to q if the following condition is satisfied. 
So uh, in this case, this Q can be anything. It could be an extended real number. Okay. So uh, let me write it like that. Uh, if now this is easier to write it write in this in the sequential sense but you can also write out an equivalent epsilon delta definition for this okay so that again i leave to you for any sequence xn such that xn is in fact greater than a right because this is a right limit for all n and xn tends to a we have f of xn tends to q right so what this is so f of a plus is basically uh, what is the limit of the function as you approach a from the right right so this is often as i said called a right limit the right limit at a okay so what happens to the function as you approach a from the right that is exactly what is being captured. As I said, this is only the uh, sequential definition. You can write an equivalent epsilon delta definition as well. The reason I have chosen to write the sequential definition is because when if I were to write an epsilon delta definition, I have to write a different definition uh, for the case where Q is real value, the case where Q is plus infinity and the case where Q is minus infinity. On the other hand, the sequential definition is more compact, right? A single definition covers all cases. Right? That's the only reason, but again, these are equivalent. Uh, analogously, you can talk about the left limit so this is equal to Q again, an extended real. If the following is true. for any sequence approaching A from the left in this case. Okay, so this is we have basically defined what it means for a function to have a limit at a we have defined what it means to for a function to have a right limit at a we have defined what it means for a function to have a left limit at a okay so obviously these two are connected namely uh, the existence of limit x tends to a f of x should be related to the existence of the right limit and the left limit and in fact the consistency of the left limit and the right limit Okay, so let me put that down as a lemma. Uh, the verification of this is a straightforward exercise, which again, once again, I'm going to leave to you. So limit x tends to a f of x exists if and only if f of a plus is equal to f of a minus. And in this case, okay, so uh, what we have said here is that limit x tends to f of x exists if and only if f of a plus equals f of a minus. Now remember in that implicit in the so when I say that f of a plus is equal to f of a minus I'm saying more than it looks I'm saying that in fact both of these objects exist and are equal right so that's implicit when I say f of a plus is equal to f of a minus it implies the existence of these two limits and also the fact that they are equal that combined uh, statement is equivalent to saying that limit x tends to f of x exists and when this holds then basically all of these three things are the same the function limit at a is equal to the right limit is equal to the left limit right 
Uh, and if you believe this, then uh, an easy remark is that f is continuous at a if and only if the function value is the same as the right limit it's also the same as the left limit right and obviously if these two are equal then this is also equal to the limit as extends to a of f of x okay so we have talked about function limits and we have talked about the connection to uh, continuity okay but now having made this connection to continuity we can actually say something about uh, you know different types of discontinuity right and what are the different ways in which a function can be discontinuous at some point a okay so let me uh, put that definition here and then we'll do a few examples uh, after So if f is discontinuous at a, uh, so we say the discontinuity is of the first kind, So called a simple discontinuity if uh, both the left limit and right limit exist. Right? So uh, if so remember that the disc Continuity implies that the left limit and the right limit must exist and moreover must be equal to the function value at a. So if you have discontinuity, then you know these two inequalities don't hold, right? This could happen because the left limit doesn't exist, the right limit doesn't exist, both don't exist or they all exist but you know they disagree or maybe the left limit and the right limit exist but that, that disagrees with the function value. All of these different ways of... Uh, discontinuities exist what the statement is telling you is that uh, we call the discontinuity to be of the first kind if the left limit and the right limit exist okay so for fun for discontinuities of the first kind well you can have uh, that either the left limit and the right limit which are assumed to exist in this case do not agree with each other or they do agree, but they do not agree with the function value at that point, right? These are both ways in which you can get discontinuities of the first kind, right? Uh, the other are called discontinuities of the second. Everything else is a discontinuity of the second kind. Else, we say, the discontinuities of the second kind. Okay, so this is just a definition classifying uh, discontinuities into two kinds. Okay, so now if you have understood these definitions, let's go through a few examples to illustrate. Right, so this is a standard pathological example that you will uh, often see. Uh, so I define the function f over the reals as follows. I'm going to define it to be 1 if x is rational and 0 if x is irrational okay uh, so this is a function which essentially is an indicator on the rationals okay so it's easy to see that this function in fact has a discontinuity of the second kind everywhere
right? And the reason for this is also fairly straightforward. I mean, with a moment's thought, you should be able to convince yourself that whatever A you choose, neither the left limit nor the right limit, in fact, will exist, right? Because of the fact that, uh, again, because as you approach any number, you're, you know, you're basically going to oscillate uh, any sequence, yeah, you will basically be able to, you will oscillate between 0 and 1, so which means that those limits don't exist. So neither the left limit nor the right limit exist in this case, okay? Uh, so in general, functions can have these kind of pathological discontinuities. However, if you're dealing with monotone functions, right, it turns out that you can say something very concrete about what kind of discontinuities are possible. In particular, it turns out that monotone functions can only have type 1 or first kind discontinuities. Okay, so this is something that I'm going to state as the following theorem. Let f be monotone increasing in say some interval a, b. Okay, then Well, f of x plus and f of x minus exist at all x belonging to a, b. Okay, so if you have a function that's monotone, then at every point, okay, in the interior of the domain, you are guaranteed that the left limit and the right limit exist. So in other words, if there is a discontinuity, it has to be of the first kind, right? Uh, moreover, you can say something more precise about how these guys are related. Right, the, it turns out that the left limit is in fact given by the supremum Uh, a less than t less than x of f of t, right? So the sup, uh, sorry. So the supremum of the yeah. So this is supremum of f of t. Sorry. Right. So the supremum of the function values to the left of a is in fact equal to the left limit. So this is equal to f of uh, let's say x minus which in turn is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to the right limit, which is in fact equal to the infimum of the function values taken to the right of x. Okay, so you can say something very concrete about uh, how the, firstly, the, if you have monotonicity, uh, then the left limit and the right limit are guaranteed to exist. And then the left limit is less than equal to the function value and less than equal to the right limit. The right limit is the infimum of the function values taken to the right of x. The left limit is the supremum of the function values taken to the left of x. Okay, so very clear. Moreover, well, the theorem is still not over. If You pick any two numbers x and y such that x is less than y then you can also say that the right limit at x is in fact less than or equal to the left limit at y okay all of this is true for a yeah that's the end of the theorem now all of this is true for a monotone increasing function okay so one can also write an analogous result for a monotone decreasing function. Alternatively, think of a monotone decreasing function as just being the negative of a monotone increasing function and port the results. But in either case, an analogous result holds. Okay, so the proof is again straightforward. I leave it to you. Okay, so I hope it's also clear from here that monotone functions can only possibly have discontinuities of the first kind, right? Because the left limit and the right limit are guaranteed to exist, right? So, yeah, 
maybe it's worth ma making a record with that Okay, so that's a straightforward corollary. So to conclude this lecture, I'm going to state one more result, which actually has something to do with the number of discontinuities that monotone functions can have. Okay, so this is actually a fairly interesting result if you haven't seen this before. Uh, let f, let's say define from a, b through r, b monotone. Uh, then the set of points where f is discontinuous is at most countable. Right, so this is actually a fairly straight, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's straightforward to prove, but an interesting result. It basically tells you that if you have a monotone function, uh, then that you can at most have countable discontinuities. So you can have either finitely many discontinu discontinuities or uh, countably many discontinuities. All of these, of course, being of the first kind. Right, so uh, we gave an example of a function before that pathological function, which is the indicator on the rationals which basically is discontinuous everywhere. It's a second kind discontinuity at, at every single point. However, if you're dealing with a monotone function, your discontinuities can only be of the first kind and the discontinuities can only be at most countable, right? Uh, another, shall we say, measure theoretic uh, way of stating this is that uh, monotone functions are continuous almost everywhere. Right, so again, uh, I'm not, this almost everywhere is actually a very technical uh, statement, which I'm not going to qualify at this point. If you if you have seen this kind of uh, statement before, then good, but this is something that we will talk about more going forward, right? This is just a different way of saying that, uh, the set of discontinuities is countable, okay? Which means that outside of these countably many points, the function is guaranteed to be continuous, okay? Uh, so let's go through the proof. Proof is in fact fairly straightforward. Uh, let E be the set of points where you have a discontinuity. Okay. Now, if you are a monotone function, it turns out, go back to that uh, set of inequalities we had written, the only possible way in which you can have a discontinuity is if the left limit is different from the right limit, right? There is a jump between the left limit and the right limit. That's the only possible way. If the left limit and the right limit are matched, the monotonicity ensures that the function value will also have to sit exactly there, which means you are going to have continuity. The only possible way you can have discontinuity is uh, if you actually have a gap between the left limit and the right limit. In other words, the left limit at the point is actually strictly less than the right limit at the point. Okay, so I'm going to use that here for any x in E, uh, there exists say r of x uh, in the set of rationals such that the following is true. Right? 
right? Why is that? Because if x has to be in E, then indeed f of x minus has to be strictly less than f of x plus, right? And we know that there is a rational between any two real numbers. And so that I should be able to find a rational between f of x minus and f of x plus. I'm just going to call that rational r of x, okay? Uh, another statement that we can make easily is the following. that r of x1 cannot possibly be r of x2 for x1 not equal to x2, right? So if I give you, uh, of course, x1, x2 in E, right? So for every element in E, I can associate with it a rational number r. And moreover, you know, this mapping is one to one. In other words, that you know, no two different points of discontinuity can be associated with the same rational number r of x. Okay, so therefore we have constructed a one-to-one -one function R that maps well e to q, right? And the existence of an injection from e to q implies that e is at most countable. Right? In our set theoretic notation, it was that cardinality of E is less than or equal to the cardinality of Q, right? So that tells you that in fact, you can only have uh, at most countably many discontinuities. You can have finitely many discontinuities or you can have countably many discontinuities. That is all that is possible for a monotone function, okay? So what we have done in this lecture is basically talked about function limits, uh, related that to continuity, limit x tends to a f of x, uh, Related that to continuity, meaning that, you know, a function is continuous if and only if the limit at that point is equal to the function value. Then we talked about left limits and right limits and said again that the limit existing is equivalent to saying that the left limit agrees with the right limit. And then finally, we made the connection to uh, monotone functions. Uh, we said that, well, if you have monotone functions, you can only have discontinuity, discontinuities of the first kind namely where the left limit and the right limit do not agree. And a straightforward consequence of that is in fact that uh, monotone functions can only have countably many type one discontinuities, okay? So that brings us to our, uh, shall we say, first cut discussion of continuity in the uh, realm of real valued functions. Uh, starting next week, we will talk about uh, uniform continuity.